Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the United Stands. I'm Mark Goldbridge and I'm joined by Fabrizio Romano for the latest Manchester United transfer news. How are you doing, Fabrizio? All good, all good. Thank you, Mark. Ready to answer and thank you again for the invitation. Good. Uh, there's lots to get into. Uh, I don't really know where to start. Kim Min Jae, Hoyland. But I think we'll start with the goalkeeper because this is a story that sort of broke uh, in the UK this morning. Uh, I'm interested to get your thoughts on it. Uh, we know that De Gea was close to signing a contract. Um, the reports this morning are that dressing room sources from Manchester United are saying it looks like he's going to go. Uh, they want a new goalkeeper. How has this fallen apart? How, 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 where, where are we with David De Gea and Manchester United? Honestly, this is a very strange situation because, as you mentioned, end of March, first week of April, the agreement between Manchester United and David De Gea was almost done. It was just about some final details they had to discuss. This is why it was not completed, but was really, really close. Now it remains close because the reality is that, uh, as of today, they are really, really close on the, uh, on, the, on the details, on the contract, so everything is in the right direction. But this is not signed. Uh, it's also true that some... Uh, Saudi clubs also approached David De Gea in the recent weeks, but this is not on player side. David De Gea would really love to continue at Man United, but he's also waiting for uh, for the club to give him the green light and say, okay, let's finalize the final points and sign. So this is a strange situation. I can tell you that about dressing room sources, what I'm hearing is that some people into the dressing room really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, they feel that David De Gea wants to continue, but they are surprised to see that this new deal is not signed yet. All of them expected De Gea to have a new deal already in place uh, at the end of April, maybe, at the beginning of May. Now we are end of June and this is not completed yet. What's real also on the market is that Manchester United are speaking to some agents to explore opportunities. We know that the original idea was to go on with David De Gea as first goalkeeper and to sign a second goalkeeper to create some competition, maybe a goalkeeper for the future. It's obvious that in case David De Gea leaves the club as free agent, in that case, they will go for an important goalkeeper. So it changes the picture. No longer a young goalkeeper to create some competition, but probably an experienced goalkeeper. Yeah. Uh, to give you an example, um, Manchester United last week asked some information about Bart Verbruggen, this goalkeeper from Anderlecht, Belgian, very talented yeah. player, who is now on the verge of joining Brighton. But then they ask it to wait a bit because they still don't know what's going to happen. So in the conversation they had on that side, it was still not clear what they're going to do. Same happened in the conversations they had for Andre Onana, because it's true that Manchester United appreciate Onana. It's true that Eric Tanag is a big fan of Andre Onana, but it's also true that at the moment they can't confirm any official bid to Inter or any concrete negotiation. So it's still a strange story. It's true that Onana is appreciated. I'm told that at the moment for Pickford there are no concrete negotiations. I saw some rumors, but I'm not aware of any bid. So let's see how Man United will decide to proceed. Uh, I also saw some links with David Raya again, but Tottenham remain the favourites to, to sign him after agreeing personal terms. So let's see. I think this week is going to be important to have more clarity on this story. Fabrizio, what, what, what do you think is holding it up? Because it doesn't sound like it's... It sounds like United would like to keep De Gea because they haven't got the funds to go and buy a top keeper. So is it yeah. De Gea waiting? Is it Ten Hag waiting? It sounds like it might be the club. Who, who is it who's holding it up? I think it's more on, on, on the club side, honestly. It's more on the club side because David De Gea would love to, to continue at United and the feeling of those close to him uh, is that the only chance to accept something else or maybe to enter into concrete negotiations with Saudi clubs is only in case May United will communicate to him, we don't want you anymore. So this kind of plan B, of backup option for, uh, for De Gea. His priority is May United and he wants to continue in uh, European elite football. So De Gea is waiting for May United. This is the point and this is the standby. Now I think timing will be important this week because he can't wait uh, that long. So this week is going to be really important. OK, um, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the the situation with the strikers. Uh, we've spoke a lot about the Harry Kane situation. It looks like that's uh, over now. Um, where wh Who is the most likely striker? Because you've said that for, um, uh, Rasmus Hoyland would love to come to Manchester United. Yeah. We've heard about Ramos and PSG. Um, it's gone quiet on Osman. What, what, it's a priority position for Manchester United. Where do you think they're looking at the moment? And, and how likely is uh, Rasmus Hoyland to be that striker? Rasmus Hoyland wants Manchester United. Uh, I can guarantee this. So he's really, really pushing to go to Manchester United. 
his intention is to join May United. Of course, it's not only May United. If tomorrow morning maybe other clubs, top clubs, will enter the race, of course, he's open to joining. For example, Bayern are monitoring him since a long time. I think Bayern and May United are on the same kind of striker for the same kind of budget. So Bayern could be a problem in this uh, in this kind of negotiations for uh, for May United. But in general, Rasmus Hoylund priority, we can say that is Manchester United. Uh, he's waiting for this situation to be resolved because at the moment Atalanta are asking for more than 60 million euros. This can become around 70 at the moment because they feel that big clubs will arrive in the next days and they are not in a rush to, to, to sell him. He has a long contract at Atalanta. They signed him just last summer. It was a very smart signing. So this is why at the moment on player side, the desire to join Manchester United is very clear. But on the other side, uh, it's not that easy to negotiate with Atalanta. It's tough for Italian clubs. Imagine when it's about clubs from abroad. So this is a situation for, uh, for Hoylund. A crucial point is that he signed in the recent weeks with SEG agency. It's the same agency of Eritanag. Uh, and this could be a factor. Of course, this is not going to change anything in case other clubs uh, join the race, but could be one of the factors. So I will keep Hoylund in Manchester United list for sure. But I also feel that they don't want to pay crazy money for a very good player with fantastic potential. But he was not a regular starter at Atalanta this season. Very talented, again, did very well with Denmark. But he's not kind of player who, for example, like Blauvic when he was at Fiorentina, is not yet at that level. And this is why Man United don't want to pay crazy money, but right money. For the other strikers, the situation is getting complicated because now we are almost at the end of June. We know that this takeover situation is creating problems. This is very clear. There is also the financial fair play. This is why, for example, May United have been very clear with the camp of Victor Osimhen. They are not going to pay 150 million euros, at least with this ownership. Then if it changes, uh, it could be different. But with this ownership, they are not going to pay 150 million fee for Victor Osimhen. Harry Kane, at the moment, May United don't have any intention to enter into a saga with Tottenham until the end of the summer and then they don't want to sell. So it's not that easy situation, but I would keep the name of Hoylund as one of the most concrete in this moment because all the others are getting probably more complicated than expected. Uh, where, where, where's Mawani at at the moment, Fabrizio? We've not heard about him for a while. Is he still on there or is he off somewhere else? He is a player that they appreciate, uh, but Bayern are leading the race for Colomuani. The main problem also there is the price. Uh, mm. It's around 100 million euros. And this at the moment is considered too much for, uh, for Colomuani. So all the clubs are probably waiting for Eintracht to change their position. But from what I'm hearing, Eintracht have no intention to change their mind. He has a long contract, same kind of situation of Hoylund. But Colomuani will be at the Euros next summer with friends playing together with Kylian Mbappé. And so their expectation is we can keep you here for one more season and sell you in summer 24 for big money. Uh, and probably to different club. So this is why it's not ever not not always easy to go for this kind of of players. But it's true that Man United appreciate Moani, but the feeling is that at the moment it's still not something that concrete. Uh, we'll stick with transfers, but I must just ask, as people in the chat are talking about it, uh, we had a big week last week where the, the share price and everything looked like Qatar were going to get hold of Manchester United. Uh, what are you hearing at the moment around the sale? Because you've been pretty good on this, Fabrizio. You said to us a couple of weeks ago you didn't think anything would happen for a, for a couple of weeks and it still hasn't happened. So what, what, what are you sort of hearing at the moment? Oh, I feel really sorry about that, honestly, for May United fans. I think it's incredible what's going on because it's crazy to enter into this transfer window with May United having no clarity in any direction. You can maybe mention whatever they prefer, maybe to stay the Glazers or maybe to sell to another group or maybe to sell to the Qatari. They can do what they want. But clarity is crucial, I think, for a top club like Manchester. Manchester United and for Eric Tanag. Eric Tanag did an incredible job. So I'm really yeah. feeling their moment. Uh, it is not easy to see other clubs maybe moving on the market and you are still there uh, in the same kind of situation as one year ago. So this is the biggest issue. What I'm hearing is that on the Qatari side, they are still very confident. So they remain very confident, but also very quiet in terms of public communication. Uh, they feel that last week was probably too much communication in terms of, okay, it's done, it's set to be completed, and it was not the case. They remain confident, they remain into this process, but they understand that it's crucial to be calm, quiet, cautious until the end of the story. So at the moment, it's not something that we can consider done because as of today, it's not done. And the timing, as we saw, uh, is, not, uh, is not that helpful for, uh, for the Qatari. So let's see how it will continue. But I think we have to be careful until the end of the story. Thank you on that, Fabrizio. Um, uh, Kim Min Jae, a lot has happened in the last few days with Bayern Munich sort of coming through. Um, two things on that. Um, how have Man United, because we know that they wanted him, and how have Man United failed here? Is it because of the takeover? And also, did United ever bother sort of putting an offer to Kim Min-jae and his agent or have they just backed out? 
I think it's very clear that Bayern made the best offer to the player and to the agent. This is the reality. Man United have been in touch with Kim Min-jae for a long time, October, November. Uh, first, they sent their scouts to move to follow the player at Napoli. Then they started conversations with the player side. So they were in very advanced talks with the player. But we always say it here, it's not a done deal because to agree with the player, you have to complete the contract agreement and guarantee that you are going to pay the release clause. And May United never guaranteed to Kim in jay that they were going to pay the release clause. It was like, okay, let's prepare this potential deal, let's discuss the terms, but was never agreed with the player and never guaranteed that they were going to play to, to pay the 50 million euros release clause. So this is the reality. I think the takeover is having a big impact on this deal, honestly. Uh, and probably the same happened with Alexis McAllister, who was a player in the list at Manchester United, but they were not able to go there uh, and, okay, let's pay the clause and let's bring the player because Chelsea have different power in the this moment in terms of future plans but mm, we know that probably Man United are doing way better on the pitch so it's incredible to be in this situation but this is the, the reality I think they have to decide now they are in a position where they have to decide what is the priority we know that the striker is the priority then there is Mason Mount because Mason Mount is a crucial deal for Man United and they want to get it done uh, Eric Tanak is a big fan of the player so I think these two positions are crucial the center back is something important, yes, but probably is not the top priority. And so in this moment, to go there and offer what Bayern offered to the player, which is a really big salary with an important commission, was not probably the priority for, uh, for Manchester United. This is the reality. If they want to change the situation, it has to be this week. Otherwise, when we enter into next week, it will be the final stages of the deal and they will be prepared to pay the close at the beginning of July. So the only chance for Man United or Newcastle or any other club to change the story is to match the bid this week. But again, Bayern are really close to the agreement with the player, with the agent. He's 90% done. And so I think Bayern are the big favourites now to, to land Kim Min-jae. Yeah, it certainly feels like, you know, as you said, with Osman, if we had a different ownership, maybe we go in. And if we had the yeah. Qatari ownership, maybe we go in for Kim Min-jae. But it, it, it's definitely a problem. Um, is it the same with Declan Rice? There was a story yesterday that Ten Hag's really frustrated. He feels that Declan Rice is almost the perfect type of midfielder he would like. Um He's playing for England tonight or is part of that squad. And then you'd expect that deal to Arsenal probably to happen. But there was talk of other bids coming in, maybe Man City. United out of that race for Rice now. Is there any possibility we could go in for that? I think it's the same situation we mentioned for Kim and for, for other players. To go there and match what Arsenal are offering, you have to be strong on the financial side. But also it's about the budget. You have if you spend all that money on rice amount then you have a problem for the striker and all the other positions we mentioned the goalkeeper uh, let's see what happens with the center back let me mention again axel disazi from monaco is one of the backup options they have but also in disazi to give an example to people to make them understand what's going on they spoke to the player side they feel that the player wants to join manchester united but at the moment there is still no concrete negotiation with monaco because they're waiting on other positions so it's kind of domino at the moment for May United and it's not that easy because of the financial fair play and, of course, because of the takeover. So this is the reality around Declan Rice. They like the player, it's true. But at the moment, to go into the race and compete with Arsenal and maybe with Man City, because Man City are informed on the Declan Rice situation, but Arsenal remain the favourites, I think at this stage is complicated for United. I suppose one thing I would say is where, where, where United could have increased their budget was by actually selling some players Sure. Is there any movement on sales? I mean, look, Saudi Arabia will pay good money. Ruben Neves is going, you know, is there any interest in, or, you know, we, Harry Maguire, Scott McTominay, um, I'm trying to think, Dean Henderson was meant to be going to Forest a couple of weeks ago. Is there any movement on any players? I know Eric Bay might be going for a couple of million, but that's not really going to help our budget. <laughs> No, at the moment, what is, I think, important to say is that Dean Anderson and Forrest remains on, but it will only be completed once Man United will clarify the goalkeeper situation, the Gear new goalkeeper. So in that moment, they will be in touch again with Forrest and try to, to complete the final details of the deal. Uh, then we know they have many players to flow, like Alex Tejas, uh, Beige. I think the real priority will try to offload these players and to find solutions also for players like uh, Donny van de Beek. I think he could be on the market this summer. I would not be surprised in case they find a solution with him because he wants to play regular football so this is a possibility too Harry Maguire there will be a conversation after this international break between Maguire and Derek Tanak to discuss his potential exit they got some proposal for Victor Inderov but at the moment for Tanak is untouchable uh, and same for Scott McTominay he's true he's in, he's in the list at Newcastle since long time but at the moment for Man United he's an important player they are not giving any green light so it's also not easy to pick the players to, to sell because some of them are important for Tanak and so you have to find the right the right balance and then there are the new contracts, and I think today probably the best news for my United is this extension imminent for Marcus Rashford. 
And trust me that this is not mm, normal news. This is a very important news because when you have your best player out of contract in one year with this takeover situation still not clear, many things can happen behind the scenes. But mm -hmm. Marcus Rashford is prepared to say yes to Man United. Eric Tenag has been absolutely crucial in this story. And so I think they can be optimistic on this new deal to be signed soon. Do we know how long that deal would be for Rashford, for Brizio, or, or roughly sort of, sort of the wages? There's not guaranteed yet, but I think uh, it will be around five years. Not guaranteed yet if it's going to be four plus one or five, but it's going to be a long-term deal. And uh, and again, Eric and Hag has been crucial since they want to extend the contract to turn down uh, Paris Saint-Germain proposals one year ago and now to convince the player to to stay and to continue at Man United. Would, that be, would he become Man United's biggest earner, do you think, now? Well, I think yes. Yeah. I think yes. <laughs> okay. Fabrizio, it's absolutely flown by. And I know you're really, really busy. Um, I will continue <laughs> and talk to the chat without you about what you've said, but I know you've got to shoot off. But absolutely fantastic. And it's a pleasure to thank have you. you on as per usual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And see you soon. Ciao. Thank you. Thanks, Fabrizio. Um, yeah. Well, look, loads to get into there. And I'll tell you what, he's a legend because I had Rashford down as a point to talk about and I completely forgot. So uh, you've got it there. We're looking at four plus one for Rashford um, and the biggest earner at the club. So he's north. I mean, there was talk. Adam was talking on the morning show about 375k. He's definitely north of 300k if he's going to be the biggest earner. Um I, I, like, I like Rashford. I like Rashford. So, you know, you're talking to the converted here, but no way, no way should we be paying that. But that's Man United. I mean, we, I, I, I don't really want to talk about Rashford because we know his wage is going to be too much. Um, I, I don't think he justifies that wage. I really don't. But I really do like the player. So it's one of those. What resonates for me the biggest is, is you listen to Fabrizio there. You look at that contract there. We are being run like a circus still. I mean, Kim Min Jae, we've been, I mean, I, I think Beth said at the weekend, oh, maybe we weren't in for Kim Min Jae. And I was away at the weekend, so I thought I'm not going to drop it in the group chat. We've been in for Kim Min Jae for most of the season. Fabrizio just confirmed it there. We've been in for Kim Min Jae most of the season. We've missed out on him because somebody wants him more than us. We're sort of like going, oh, we don't know whether we want a goalkeeper, a striker, a midfielder, a centre-back. We don't know what to do with the limited cash we've got. Oh, Kim and Jay, we don't know what to do. And Bayern Munich just sweep in and go, we really want you. There's the money. This is what you're worth. We want you in the team. Come and join us. And he looks at Man United and going, oh, we don't know what to do today. We don't know what to do. Yeah, I think I'll go to Bayern Munich. Declan Rice, we do really like you. We've scouted you for ages, but we don't know what to do. Arsenal, yeah, we do want you. This is what we're going to pay you. Come and join our, our club. Yeah, I think I'll leave indecisive United alone. Um, Rasmus Hoyland. I mean, look, Fabrizio is not the source for me on this, but I got quite excited today about Fabrizio saying that Rasmus Hoyland really wants to come to Manchester United. I've said this to you for about three weeks now. Hotter than the sun, Rasmus Hoyland to Manchester United. This is the deal to be done for a striker. I was saying this even when Harry Kane was in the race. It looks very much like that deal is there. Um, but... I will not say 90% because that's a jinx. And I will not say deal done 100% because we're Manchester United. And as he said there, there will be other clubs that could swoop in like Bayern Munich, etc. But the bottom line is Rasmus Hoyland wants to come to Manchester United. This is the deal that he wants. Ten Hag wants him. We've done a lot of groundwork, but we all know who can mess this up. So, yes, I've said it to you for weeks. And if it happens, I'll be like, I told you, Agent Goldbridge, whatever you want to say. You might say something else. But the reality is, of course, that deal's there to be done. And I, when I said it three weeks ago, there was loads of other options still on the table. But he has now come through from where he was three weeks ago to number one most likely striker. We should do it. I think we will do it. But we could mess it up because the one thing that is just running through this whole transfer window and is you might have seen my video on yesterday where I, I was talking about frustration and, and, and everything. We are messing up deal after deal after deal after deal because we're just not, we're, we're useless. We're absolutely useless. We've got negotiators who can't negotiate. We've got a budget that we don't even understand what it is. We've got owners who are selling, staying or keeping a little bit. Um, and we're up against competent football clubs for players that Ten Hag wants. I mean, the person... Um, but um, Fabrizio just let slip a gem, a gem there. United couldn't even confirm they would pay the release clause, even as a minimum. What the hell have we been doing, says SK? He did. There, there was some crack. I want to go through what Fabrizio said. But ultimately, the overarching thing is, unfortunately, 
this is a circus at Manchester United again. We don't know what we're doing. I mean, let's go through what Fabrizio said. The goalkeeping situation even for, even confused him. And I'm still confused because what he said is, and I really wanted to speak to Fabrizio about this because I know he's got his sources around the club, very good sources. He said, look, you speak to people in the dressing room. Look, Samuel Lucas this morning has said that dressing room sources think De Gea's going. We can all guess who Samuel Lucas's sources are and we can all guess who Fabrizio's sources are. I would say Fabrizio's sources are more likely to be people like, you know, the Bruno Fernandezes of this world who like and respect David De Gea. They are. So, so Fabrizio says the dressing room sources he's spoken to are confused as to what's going on. Uh, this morning in the Manchester Evening News, they're saying, yeah, De Gea's going. People don't want him. So it's a diff different type of sources. The sources that might be talking to them will be different to them. There's people in that dressing room who really like David De Gea. There'll be people in that dressing room who want his spot potentially or, or don't like him. So um, that deal should have been signed by now. So what Fabrizio is saying is that De Gea will sign it. He wants to sign it. He's loyal to Manchester United. There's somebody at United who's saying no. But then on the other hand, Ten Hag wants him to stay because he doesn't want to spend his budget on a £50 million goalkeeper when he can't he hasn't got enough to buy a Declan Rice or, you know, a £100 million striker. So it's all really confusing. I personally think what's happening here is United have missed out on a number of targets. They've got a budget of about £200 million. And what they're doing is they're going, well, if you get Rasmus Hoyland for 50 that's not a £100 million striker. You could go and get a goalkeeper. But then they're going, but what do we do about... We've missed out on Kim Min Jae, so that's another 50 we haven't got to spend. So you could get a goalkeeper. I think they are literally changing their... And this is unprofessional, by the way. This is really unprofessional. But I think what's happened is they went into this summer transfer window. They were like, let's keep De Gea. Let's get a cheap young goalkeeper. Let's get Kim Min Jae. Let's get Mount. Let's get Rabio And let's get Harry Kane. And I think that would have been the summer. And that would have been... That's the budget, Right. They're no longer getting Harry Kane. Let's get Rasmus Hoyland for half the price. They're no longer getting Kim Min Jae. That's another 40, 50 million they've saved. So now they're going, well, maybe we can buy a goalkeeper instead of Kim Min Jae and we're getting a cheaper striker. And we'll still get Mount, but we haven't got him yet. And it, I think they're adapting their budget by the day as they miss out on number one targets. So look, I get it. People get excited. Beth FC, they get excited because we might buy Anana or Costa. But it's obvious the reason we might buy an Arna or Costa is because we're missing out on the players that we want, which is making us go for cheaper options, which is creating more budget. So Kim Min Jae will go for a cheaper option. Harry Kane will go for a cheaper option. Oh, we've got a bit more money. Let's go for a goalkeeper. And that's fine. And it might work out. But the problem is we are Manchester United and we should not be being run like this. You know, Ten Hag gets his fourth choice striker, his third choice centre back. And we replace the keeper. I mean, is that good? Is that bad? So it's just, this is what happens at Manchester United when you've got negotiators and owners who can't do their job. Ten Hag hands a list in. I reckon his list was the Anderlecht goalkeeper, Kim Min Jae, Rabiot, Mount, Harry Kane. I think that was it. He hasn't got Kane. He hasn't got Kim Min Jae. And it's all like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? Um, but, one of the telling things that Fabrizio said was in relation to the striker, Rasmus Hoyland wants to join Manchester United and they've said to Victor Osman, we can't afford your release clause. So unless the ownership changes. So a couple of times Fabrizio has said that and he said it again today. If the ownership changes at Man United, maybe they can get Kim Min Jae. Maybe they can get Victor Osman. But the way we are, this is all underpinned by the ownership. Imagine how frustrating being a scout at United must be, says Joshua. I recommend all these players and talents just for them to bottle it. Nathan says, uh, thoughts on show speed meeting Cristiano for the first time. I saw your comment on his post. Such a wholesome moment. And you've got to be happy for him. Love the show. He's taking his time. But yeah, I mean, that's 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 dream works, isn't it? Fantastic. Um, but yeah, so we spoke about uh, we've spoke about the goalkeeper situation. Let's wait and see. This could be a big week. Kim Min Jae. Fabrizio said it himself. We wanted Kim Min Jae. We've been after him for months, but basically we don't know what our priorities are. We're basically saying to players, wait and see, wait and see. You can't say wait and see to a to a player that's that good in the middle of June. So Bayern Munich just swoop in and do the deal. Um, 
the anger and frustration has to be aimed at the owners. Like it has to be. I know we've got incompetent negotiators, recruitment. We have. But ultimately, this is all coming down to the ownership. Um, I, the person I feel sorry for the most is Eric Ten Hag because he produced a very, very, very good season last year. And now he's already missed out on his number one centre-back, his number one striker and his number one midfielder. So, Because his number one midfielder is either Declan Rice, Frankie de Jong or Casido. Now, one of those doesn't want to leave Barca, so that's fine. But two of them are moving. So already I can sit here and say... He's down to his third or fourth choice striker. God knows whether we'll even get a centre-back. He's probably down to his third or fourth choice holding midfielder if he gets Rabio. We're still hanging in there for his first choice number eight, which is Mason Mount. It's it's not good for Ten Hag. And, you know, th this situation is being, you know, manufactured by the Glazers and their pure incompetence, I'm afraid. Um, Highland is probably about as done as Osman or any other player who'd want to come to United, but it's all about United paying or negotiating the price, as Duncania. Uh, they said they had a plan for the summer, adapting day by day isn't a strategy, it's a panic, says SK. How much longer for these owners to get rid of these guys, says SK. Thoughts on Rashford's future at the club? We'll come back to that, K. And just come in, did Fabrizio have any news on player sales? Club can't spin that sale of the club would affect selling players, just more incompetence, says Spencer. Well, I did ask that question, Spencer, um, about sales, because basically what Fabrizio said is a lot of United's failings this summer so far are because of the sale of the club. They had to sit still while Kim Min Jae goes to Bayern. They've had to sit still while Declan Rice probably goes to Arsenal. Casido goes to Chelsea. They're missing out on targets because they don't have the budget. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to prioritise. Um, they can't bid for Osman. They can't really bid for Kane. They haven't got the financial stability or knowledge to do that. So I said, well, one thing they could do to boost their transfer budget is sell some players. But even that's indecisive. The chat with Harry Maguire has not been had yet. Why did we not do that two months ago? The chat with Scott McTominay, well, he's a valued player. I'm sorry, he is not good enough for Manchester United. Like, he is the prime example of nice guy, works hard, not good enough, sell him. People will buy him. Oh, let's keep it. I don't have a lot of sympathy with United here. And you could take this up to Ten Hag if you wanted to. Harry Maguire wasn't good enough six months ago. Why do you need to have a chat with him at the end of June? It should have happened in April. Like Klopp's releasing players already. You know, Klopp's telling players two months ago they're going. So Maguire should have been told by now. What what what's to what's to discuss? He's not good enough. He should be gone. McTominay, look, he doesn't get anywhere near the first team. Get rid of him. Um, obviously, Eric Bay, Teles, Henderson, I understand why we're waiting to see what happens with De Gea, but Donny van der Beek looks like he's going. That was quite interesting. That's just dropped into my head. Looks like Donny van der Beek will be going. That that, that came in from Fabrizio as well. Um, they said they had to plan for the summer. I've done that from SK. And uh, Nathan says, this isn't down to the uh, director of football. They don't know good enough, but this is down to the owners. They are the ones who employed these staff. You can't blame the staff. Exactly, Nathan. So, look, we're not really doing anything with sales. Eric Bay, apparently, we are going to get a couple of million for i mean to be honest with you i wouldn't even i wouldn't piss on two million pounds i would in real life but in footballing terms it's not going to boost that transfer budget is it i mean the glazers wouldn't even take two million as a dividend i mean it's it's ridiculous and what i find hilarious is wolves are getting like 50 million from saudi arabia and what why can't why can't we do some why, why can't we sell bloody Eric Bay to Saudi Arabia for for 100 million or something like that. Like we we've, we've got loads of crap to get rid of. Why can't we sell some players to Saudi Arabia for massive money? Um but look, I, I, uh, Ferocious says is Eric Ten Hag too soft? No, I think he's a fantastic manager and I you know, you know me, I'll back him to the hilt. But I am a little bit confused on the sale process. Why would you keep Scott McTominay? He's going to be 27 years of age this year. He's not good enough for the first team. He's a nice guy to have around. He's not good enough. He's just not good enough. He doesn't get anywhere near the bench of Man City, Liverpool, or Newcastle. Well, no, well, Newcastle pick him. Newcastle will buy him actually. So sell him there, but not good enough. Proven not good enough over years and years and years. And yet, oh, we don't want to get him. We don't want to let him go. He's too valuable. I, I just don't rate the guy. I'm sorry. I, it's not even personal. I just don't rate the guy. There's, just move him on. You could get 20 million in. 20 million. That, that could be the difference between getting Kim Min-jae and not getting Kim Min-jae. But we just, 
there are elements of this transfer window that are completely on the sale process. I agree with that. But also it looks like there are elements. We can't shift it all onto the owners because when it comes to sales, we're in control of that. You know, the manager, the director of football, the CEO, we're in control of that. You're up for sale. You're up for sale. Get out. You know, simple as that. Why are we not doing those things? And again, I think it comes down to the sale again in some part because, you know, I, I don't know what it's like to work in a football club when you're up for sale, but maybe maybe the sales aren't going through because of that. I don't know. Mark, why are we the only club that have to stick to financial fair play, says Chris? The financial fair play is a myth for Manchester United. Uh, this whole we've got to abide by financial fair play is a load of crap. Um, you know, there's all sorts of rumours going around at the moment in relation to Chelsea and stuff. The, the financial fair play thing is a load of crap. The Glazers use financial fair play as a reason to pull the balaclava over your eyes and make you not see the truth. The truth is, if you say financial fair play is restricting us, it's the same as we don't want to spend any money because we want to keep it. I don't believe financial fair play is Man United's excuse. I think it's just about not spending money so the Glazers can keep hold of it. I've always felt that. Eric Ten Hag may have to wait to sell players because he has no direction from the club as to whether he will have the funds to replace them. Good point, Stephen. Good point. Uh, in relation to the sale, I did ask Fabrizio. He basically said that um, Qatar remained confident, but nothing is done yet. Um, I think last week um, there was a few cheerleaders out there that sort of went too soon, didn't they? Um, I'm sure there is a lot of confidence I'm still confident that Qatar wins the race, but, you know, the race is not run. It's not over yet. Um, but, yeah, I think last week, is, look, it's a bank holiday in, in New York today in America, so there's no stock exchange or anything anyway. But um, maybe maybe tomorrow we get some movement on that. Uh, SK says, you're right about financial fair, fair play. It's there, but it's used uh, as an excuse. How can they explain Rashi's new contract if financial fair play is an issue? Right, it says SK. Um, just going back to Rashford's, I mean, looks out, looks, I mean, look, this might upset you a little bit, but Fabrizio said it himself. Mason Mount's the priority at the moment. Now, I like Mason Mount. Harry says, what do you think will happen with the goalkeeper situation? I will give you my thoughts on that. Remember, I'm back now, so I'll be live at 8 o'clock tonight as well. Uh, we can get into more Q&A there. But um, look, I like Mason Mount. I'm not mad about Mason Mount. Eric Ten Hag is. I think that's a dangerous move for Eric Ten Hag. Not because it could be a genius move, but I just think it's not a popular transfer with the fan base. So I think that, I just worry about English mentality. I, I think there aren't many English players with good mentality. Um, and, and I don't know. I just don't know how the rest, I don't know how the fan base are going to react to Mason Mount if it doesn't work out. Um, but, you know, good point from Notorious. He says, City are thinking about getting rid of Gundogan and we want to keep Scott McTominay. Well, there, there's levels to this game. Of course there are. On the Rashford contract, personally, what are your thoughts about it? But personally, I'm happy. I like Rashford. He's got one year left on his deal. It would be criminal if he was allowed to go. But because he's got one year left on his deal, he was always going to win. Whether you like Rashford or not, whether you like his what he stands for, his agents, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. He quite rightly was always going to win because United have messed up again. You've got one of your best players with a year left on his contract. If you don't give him what he wants... He will go, I'll think about it. And he'll think about it till Christmas. And then he'll start getting phone calls in January from PSG and everywhere else. United, we're always going to have to pay big. I, I don't blame Rashford in this game. I don't blame his agent. I don't blame him. He was always going to get 350, 400, 375, whatever it is, a week. It's ridiculous. He ain't worth that. Not many players are worth that. But he is not worth that. He had a really good season last year, but that wasn't a 375 grand a week, 350 grand a week season. No way. But we're always going to pay it because we're in what we're going to do. He's mid 20s. He's in the prime of his life. Um, he's an easy 100 million pound player. He's got 12 months left on his deal. He's got all the power. He'd walk, if I was his agent, I'd walk in and say 400 grand a week, knowing that if they gave me 350, happy days. We've this is United. This is what we do. We're apparently reducing the wage bill. We're not reducing the wage bill. We can't, you can't reduce the wage bill. You know what? 
it's like sheeps. It's like a, it's like it's like a bunch of sheep going up to a pack of wolves and saying, "We've decided you can't eat us on weekends. We want to enjoy our weekends in freedom in the field. You know, we want to run around. You know, have a few beers, kick a ball about in the safety, knowing that we're not going to get eaten by a wolf." Sheep cannot dictate to wolves what's going to happen and when they're going to get eaten or not. And United and their negotiation team are like a pack of sheep. And anybody who negotiates us is the wolf. And Rashford and his team in this situation, they're dictating the terms to the sheep. That's just the way it is. And until United become the wolf or the bear or anything else that can actually fight, this is what happens. So I don't begrudge Rashford getting the money. I just think United are bloody stupid. And I think we're stupid about Kim Min Jae. And I think we're stupid about Harry Kane. I think we're stupid about Declan Rice. But, you know, we become accustomed to this. Uh, why are we getting only 10, 15 or 20 million for our players while Atalanta are asking us 70 million to Zakash? Because we're the sheep and they're the wolf. That's it. That's that's simply it. If we're going to go for Anana, we need to do it soon. Ten Hag will want a goalkeeper in like Anana as soon as possible. Levi. I don't think Eric on the goalkeeper. My honest opinion is this: Eric Ten Hag was happy for David De Gea to get the contract, work with David De Gea for another year, get a younger goalkeeper in, and spend the money on the priority areas. Because they've messed up the priority areas, they're trying to say, "Well, should we go for a goalkeeper now?" I think that I think that um, the goalkeeper situation is really hard to predict. Um, I think it's a, what I will say is this. I think it's absolutely appalling. I don't look if David De Gea leaves and you get the goalkeeper you want. Well done. You, you get what you want. And I'm pleased for you. Genuinely, I, I am. But it's not what I want, of course. But what really annoys me is. And listen to what Fabrizio said. I believe there's a level of class in this football club. I remember Rio Ferdinand saying that after his last game for United, he didn't even know it was his last game. He sat in the dressing room and Ed Woodward came in and said, we're not giving you a new contract. Um, I think that treating your legends like that is a disgrace. David De Gea has been at this club for over a decade. He's won a title. He's won many Player of the Year awards. Why? And it, and it, and it makes me sad, actually, that there are United fans out there that want De Gea to go. Because we should be up in arms about this. Forget whether he goes or not. What a way to treat a club legend of this football club in the sense that he's ready to sign the contract and they're basically saying, we don't know whether we want you. I mean, that's disgusting. Is that what Man United has become? Because that's not what we are as fans, but that's what the club has become. We don't know whether we want you. You can wait a week. You don't treat people like... You don't treat Harry Maguire like that. You certainly don't treat, treat David De Gea like that. It's disgusting. And that's what I think is happening. I think they're going, we don't, know whether we don't know whether we want to give you the contract or not. This is a guy that's been here for over 10 years. This is a guy that they've negotiated a contract with that he's ready to sign. And then now they're going, we don't know whether we want you to stay or not. It's, it's a horrible way for a football club to be run, but add it to the list of horrible ways this football club is run by the Glazers. So what do I think will happen with the goalkeeper situation? I mean, you know, we should be signing Rasmus Hoyland, hotter than the sun. <laughs> Would it surprise you if you ended up at Bayern? It shouldn't happen, but, you know, we'll see. Um, Barcelona forced their players to reduce their wages. Why can't we do it, says Mohamed? Because I would imagine in the case of someone like Rashford, they'll go and sign for somebody else, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Um, anyway. Thanks everyone for watching. We're back at eight o'clock. If anything happens before, we will go live as well. Really interesting updates in that show today. Loved it. Good to be back. Make sure you smash a like on the video and subscribe. Um, well worth a rewatch. Some really good stuff there that I probably even missed talking about from Fabrizio. Take care, everyone. Speak to you in a bit.